Hello and welcome to video four for week seven. In this video, I want to do two proofs talking about the things we defined this week, particularly inverse matrices, kernels, and images. So the first thing I want to prove is taking an M by N matrix, so that's a matrix with domain Rn and target space Rm, and prove that the dimension of the kernel and the dimension of the image add up to the dimension of the domain. And this is a really, really nice thing to know. It tells us some balance, and it also sort of tells us what the matrix destroys and what the matrix preserves. So the image, all outputs, those are the dimensions that are preserved. The kernel, everything that gets sent to zero, those are the dimensions that are destroyed. So a matrix can collapse dimensions, projections do this, um, and it can collapse some number of dimensions and leave some other dimensions intact. How many dimensions get collapsed is the dimension of the kernel. How many dimensions get preserved is the dimension of the image. So it makes sense those must add up to the dimension of the starting domain. But I want to give you an, an, a more formal argument using the definitions of kernel and image that we have so far. So what is the proof? Dimension of the image is the rank. Why do we know that? Well, we know that the image is the row space. Sorry, the column space, rather. And we know that the dimension of the column space is the rank. So the dimension of the image is the rank, the rank is the number of leading ones. The dimension of the kernel is the number of free variables. How do we know that? Well, to calculate the kernel, we put m in an extended matrix where we have a row or a column of zeros extended to this matrix. We solve this as if we were solving a system. And the dimension of the solution space of a system is the number of free parameters on this side of the matrix. Every column without a leading one will be a free parameter. So M has some number of columns. Some of these columns are going to have leading ones. Some of these columns are not going to have leading ones. Any column with a leading one contributes to the rank. So that contributes to the dimension of the image. Any column without a leading one gives me a free variable for the system. So it contributes to the rank or contributes to the dimension of the kernel. So we see in this way that the kernel and the image fit together. What these add up to is the number of columns, but the number of columns, this is an M by N matrix, the number of columns is the second number N, is precisely, as I've said many times in the last couple of videos, the dimension of the domain. And there you have it, the number of columns, each column either has a leading one, so it adds to the rank, to the dimension of the image, or it doesn't have a leading one, so it's a free variable dimension of the kernel. Add those two up, we get the number of columns. That's the dimension of the domain of the function. Second thing I want to prove today. If I have an n by n matrix, invertibility is a thing we only consider for square matrices. This matrix is invertible if and only if its kernel is zero. This makes sense because the kernel is the space of things that are sent to zero. And if we have a large kernel, that means we collapse many, many things down to zero. And that's not something we can undo. If we collapse a whole line or a whole plane down to zero, we can't pull zero back out to that whole line or that whole plane. That's not a thing that a, a function of any kind can do. A function has to send each input to some individual output. We can't send the zero input to all infinitely many things that were on that original line or that original plane. So it makes sense that the only way we can find a way back with our transformation is if no information is lost. And that means that nothing is collapsed to zero. That means the kernel is only the zero vector, which has to, of course, go to the zero vector in the target. So hopefully it makes sense that M is invertible if and only if its kernel is zero. But now let me give you an argument for it. Invertible matrices reduce to the identity matrix. We know that from the algorithm. To invert a matrix, we put it into an extended matrix with the identity. We try and row reduce. If we get the identity here, then the matrix on the other side is the inverse matrix. If we don't get the identity here, then the matrix is not invertible. So only if a matrix row reduces to the identity can, be, can it be inverted. But the identity matrix is ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So if an n by n matrix with n's with ones down the diagonal has exactly n leading ones, that means the dimension of the image, which is the rank of the matrix, which is the number of leading ones, has to be n. 
But we just proved in the previous proposition that the dimension of the image plus the dimension of the kernel equals the dimension of the domain, and the domain here is Rn, so the kernel must have dimension 0, because this number and this number have to add up to n, and the only thing you can add to n and add up to n is of course 0. So the kernel is dimension 0. What is dimension 0? A point. The kernel has to include the 0 vector, because the 0 vector always stays at the 0 vector, so this means that the kernel has to be 0. In the statement on the previous page, I said a matrix is invertible if and only if it row reduces to the identity. Whenever you see if and only if, that means we want a two-directional implication. I have proved one direction here. I assumed invertibility, and I concluded that the kernel is 0. If I'm to do an if and only if proof, I have to reverse this as well. Sometimes this reversal is easy, sometimes this reversal is quite difficult. In this case, thankfully, it's quite easy. I can literally reverse all of these steps. If I assume the kernel is 0, well then the kernel and the image have to add up to n, so the image has to be n. The image dimension of the image is the rank, so there has to be n leading ones. The only matrix that has n leading ones is the identity matrix, so the matrix has to row reduce to the identity. And if row reduces to the identity, it is invertible. So that gives me the other direction. But even though the steps are basically reversible, I still have to state that. If I'm going to make this proof of an if and only if statement, I have to make sure I state that I'm going this direction and then I'm reversing it, I'm going these dire this direction, both directions are proved. An if and only if statement requires both directions to be proved. We've proved both of those things, so now we can say that a matrix is invertible in the if and only if its kernel is zero. I'm already collecting a number of properties of invertible matrices, so let me catalog those for you for a moment. And we're going to add to this list as the course goes on. It's really nice to have a, a bunch of ways to check the invertibility of matrices. It's really a very important property. Very often we're going to want to work with only invertible matrices. We want to be able to check a bunch of different ways. So if I have an n by n matrix, all of the things on this page are equivalent, so each of them implies all the other statements. First, a matrix is invertible, and that's equivalent to it row reducing to the identity, and that's equivalent to it have rank, having rank n, that's equivalent to its image being the entire space, it's equivalent to its kernel being zero, as we proved before, and this is also equivalent, speaking more geometrically, to the idea that m preserves dimensions. If it acts on a plane, the output will still be a plane. If it acts on a line, the output will still be a line. If it acts on a three space, the output will still be a three space. All of that ties together to the idea with the kernel being zero that we're not losing any information. We might stretch and spin and do all sorts of things to these, but we're not going to lose dimensions. We're not going to collapse any lines down to zero. We're not going to collapse any planes down to zero. An invertible matrix can do all sorts of things, rotations, reflections, skews, dilations, twists of various types, but it can't destroy dimensions. It must preserve the dimension of the object. It sends lines to lines, sends planes to planes.